All right. Um, yeah, thanks for that introduction, Trevor. Um, it's, it's my pleasure to be here today. And um, as Trevor mentioned, I'm gonna to talk to you today about environmental DNA and um, specifically with a focus on a fish species that some of you may be familiar with, um, that's called Pacific lamprey. And before I get into talking about this research, I wanna highlight um, that as an aquatic research biologist with the Forest Service, I have um, another unique position or aspect to my position, which is that all of my research occurs in collaboration with at least one or multiple tribal natural resource agencies. And so I wanna acknowledge that, acknowledge the tribes um, on the land that we are doing our research. And also mention that there are a lot of reasons to collaborate with tribes. There's a legal obligation from this um, perspective of the United States government to, to fulfill trust responsibility with the tribes, but also Native Americans were the original land managers in North America. And so through those collaborations, we have so much to learn from the centuries of knowledge that they've gained um, by managing and studying um, and coexisting with fish and wildlife. So Pacific lamprey, I'm gonna start out with a little bit of background on this species because I think a lot of folks may not be familiar with them. They're not quite as, um, not quite as popular or charismatic maybe as this trout and salmon that we're used to seeing um, and talking about in the Pacific Northwest. Um, Pacific lamprey are an ancient lineage of jawless fish. And um, they are, their native range is the Pacific coast and inland to Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. So basically anywhere where salmon and steelhead occur, that also is generally the range of Pacific lamprey. A little bit about their life cycle. Um, oh, I should say too, being an ancient jawless fish, they have no bones. They're completely cartilaginous, um, which is another just interesting feature about this fish. The juveniles live in streams up to seven years and they burrow in the sediment. And then in this picture here, you can see those different life stages. So this one at the top is the juvenile, also known as the amicete. And you can see it has no eyes um, because it doesn't need any. It's just burrowed in the sediment and eating um, detritus and, and uh, algae that's growing on rocks and, and stuff like that. After about seven years, they emerge from the gravel and metamorph into what um, is sometimes referred to as macrothalmia. And then they migrate out to the ocean and they begin a parasitic life stage. So the adults are anadromous. And for those of you that don't know that word, that means that it's a species that spawns or is born in freshwater and then goes out to the ocean to get very big and then comes back to the freshwater, returns to the freshwater to spawn. And so that's the same as um, our, our salmon, our Pacific salmon, they're also anadromous. But unlike Pacific salmon, lamprey are parasitic. Um, Pacific lamprey are parasitic and they um, feed on blood from other species, including salmon um, that they might hitch a ride on out to the ocean. And then after about two years in the ocean, they return to those fresh waters to spawn. Now, Pacific lamprey are also a very culturally important species to many Native American tribes in the Columbia River Basin and surrounding area. Um, for many of these tribes, lamprey were a very predictable and reliable source of food. They also have a higher um, caloric content um, per weight than salmon. And so that was another reason why they were a really um, important food source. And so you can here see some photos. Um, they're probably about 100 years old. There was a Umatilla um, lamprey drying camp, so a, a method of preserving the lamprey to eat um, and use as medicine throughout the year, and then a child also harvesting lamprey. And um, when you see this next photo, uh, Pacific lamprey returning about 100 years ago to Willamette Falls, just outside Portland, you can see why this was a really reliable and predictable food source. Like salmon, they would come back at the same time every year and come back in very large numbers. Um, however, over time, again, like Pacific salmon, we've seen a dramatic decline in the species. And there are a lot of reasons for this, um, which include impacts to water quality and habitat quality throughout their range. But really the biggest reason, um, biggest factor driving their decline are the hydropower dams that we have built throughout, the, um, throughout our um, rivers of the Pacific Northwest. And so um, in this map here, you can see all of these dams um, located throughout um, at least the main stem rivers here um, in Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. 
Um, and while there has been a lot of mitigation to allow fish passage at these dams, that fish passage has focused on the swimming ability of salmon and trout. However, lampreys swim very differently. As you noted, they, they look a lot like snakes, so they don't have the same swimming ability and a lot of those mitigated um, infrastructure to allow salmon to pass don't accommodate the swimming capabilities of Pacific lamprey. So as we've seen a lot of uh, reductions or loss of Pacific lamprey, they were listed in 2003, or excuse me, they were petitioned for listing in 2003 under the Endangered Species Act. And um, the Fish and Wildlife Service reviewed the data and they came back um, with, with an answer that, yeah, Pacific lamprey are in decline, but right now we just don't have enough information to even understand how much they have declined, um, how at risk they really are. And so we can't list them at this time. We simply need more information. So, okay, that puts us in a position of biologists that care about this species um, and all different partners and stakeholders that care about this species is, oh, what do we do next? We need to collect more information, right? Um, so what do we know about Pacific lamprey? This map here shows the historic range of Pacific lamprey in the contiguous United States. Um, and it's broken up into, into units that are sub-basins. And um, that's um, the same as if you're familiar with hydrologic codes. Um, this is fourth code hydrologic units or HUCs. Um, and each of these sub-basins have been ranked on uh, the status of Pacific lamprey. And so you can see areas that are more red or hotter are more likely to be extinct or presumed extinct, whereas those that are more green are, are faring a little better, but even on this scale, everything, almost every basin is considered vulnerable at least. Um, and then we have a number of basins that are black, and those are simply not ranked because there's no information to, to know what the status is. And so we have this hole, um, this gap in our knowledge. And um, that's been routinely cited. The Fish and Wildlife Service said so in their um, decision on listing, lack of information is the primary challenge to managing Pacific lamprey. So um, I also wanna note that it's not surprising given the, the locations of hydrologic dams throughout this area that the more inland uh, sub-basins are more likely to be um, critically imperiled or possibly extinct or even presumed extinct. And that's because the fish that um, have to navigate up river systems to get there, have to navigate that many more hydrologic dams. All right, so what do we need to know then to, to protect this species? Well, we need to know, you know, are, are Pacific lamprey even present in some of these where we have no information or where they're presumed extinct? And then even when we know that they're present in a basin, it's going to be useful to know how, how much of this basin do they occupy? And then over time, it will be really valuable to understand how has this changed um, since before we built all these hydrologic dams? And also how is it changing over time with efforts to um, protect and restore Pacific lamprey? However, there are a lot of challenges to answering these questions. So for example, there is a lot of area that needs to be covered. And much of this area, as I'm sure all of you are familiar with, is really quite remote. There are wilderness areas, there's rugged mountain terrain, and it's just difficult to get to these places, particularly when there are no trails or roads to access streams in those areas. Another note that's um, important to, to uh, pay attention to is that there's also some freshwater lamprey that are native to much of this area too. And when you're looking at the juveniles that are burrowed in sediment, they don't have very many distinguishing characteristics that allow you to um, decipher exactly what species you're looking at is. And so um, even when you're out there looking at, at individuals, it can be difficult to tell, well, which species is it and how do I know which box this checks? So um, how do we overcome these challenges? Well, luckily a tool has emerged in, in the last 10 years or so that actually addresses uh, most of these challenges. And as you may know from um, sort of today's topic, that tool is environmental DNA. So what is environmental DNA? Well, environmental DNA is simply DNA from the environment um, that can be sampled from the environment rather than directly handling the target organism itself. So it's a very simple definition. I like to think about it sort of like forensics, right? Um, if you had a crime scene, you could swab 
um, a, a wine glass and see who is at the crime scene. But instead of looking for a particular individual, in this case, we're looking for species in streams and rivers. So what does this process look like? I know Trevor and Ari, who's here today too, and, and Evan have all participated in this process, but um, I'd like to bring you into this process a little bit too, because there's some really neat aspects to it. So we have the Pacific lamprey, um, and for that matter, any, any living being in the stream or water, whether that's a fish or a plant or a mussel or an invertebrate, and those individuals are shedding DNA into their environment just by their normal metabolic processes, but through feces, skin cells, through mating um, practices. And as that DNA is released into the water, we can simply filter it out of the water and then take that filter with all of this DNA back to the lab and analyze that DNA on the filter to determine if Pacific lamprey are present. Now, uh, Currently, the most sensitive and the, the best methods for understanding if a particular species is present um, use a method called quantitative PCR. And I want to take a moment to talk about this because this is PCR has become a little bit of a buzzword for us in the last 12 months. And I want to make um, a connection here. So quantitative PCR is actually the same uh, lab method or lab analysis that's being used for testing COVID samples to determine if somebody um, is shedding COVID viral um, particles or not. And it's the exact same method that we're using for eDNA when it comes to a lab setting, which is pretty cool. In both cases, we have a sample, whether we're taking a swab from somebody's nose or we're taking a water sample and filtering out DNA, and we're bringing it into the lab to determine if there's DNA of that COVID viral um, virus present or DNA of Pacific lamprey present. And a little bit about how this works is um, in the lab, we can bind the sample with, with a special molecule that's very specific to the unique DNA sequence of the target. Now that target again could be the COVID virus or it could be an animal like Pacific lamprey if you were, for example, looking at an eDNA sample. Now this special molecule um, also contains a fluorescent component. Um, another word for this uh, molecule that we use is an eDNA assay. And so this eDNA assay is going to be an exact match for the unique DNA sequence of our target and it has a fluorescent molecule. And when that target species assay or molecule connects with DNA of the target species, so when we have our lamprey assay um, coming into contact with lamprey DNA, we get the emission of light from that fluorescent molecule. And basically we have a machine that has a tiny camera that looks for light and it spits out a graph that looks like this. How much light do we see over the course of the reaction? And it's the same thing for the PCR COVID test. Now, if somebody um, doesn't have COVID and their sample is negative or we don't detect Pacific lamprey DNA in the water, we're not gonna detect any light. So we're just gonna have a flat line there over the course. So it's kind of cool how some of these medical advances and medical technologies really feed into other areas of life, right? So we're using these tools that were initially developed for medical practices and, and diagnostic tools for disease to start um, and look at conserving wildlife too. So I think that's a really nice connection. But the important part is that we can't, it's not enough to just know is a sample positive or negative? Do we detect COVID or lamprey or not? What we need to do is put all of this in context. And so for COVID, this means looking at infection rates over time or for species um, in rivers and streams, it means looking at where do they occur over space? And then in many instances as well over time with respect to um, where are their declines, where are they um, recovering? So this then is the last step in the eDNA process. We determine if our target species DNA is present or if lamprey DNA is present in the sample. And then we take all of the samples across space and look at where they fall on the landscape. Now, another thing to note about eDNA is it's so sensitive. It can detect even just a single molecule, a single copy of DNA in a sample. And also it's super efficient. So um, folks like Ari and Trevor have been able to go out and collect even up to a dozen or two dozen samples in a single day. Now, if you're trying to go out with a fish crew and actually sample physically for lamprey 
at best you might get two or three sites done in a day. So it's super time efficient. And it's this, um, oh, one other note is that DNA doesn't lie, right? So because we've built an assay that is specific to specific lamprey DNA, we know that a positive detection um, is not going to be confused with the freshwater lamprey that may also be in that stream. So that resolves some of the issues of even if you physically capture a juvenile lamprey, um, you, there's no issue with determining what species it is when you're looking at the DNA. So it's highly specific, sensitive, and efficient. And with this in mind, we have been working with a large number of collaborators, including the Mid Coast Watershed Council, to um, build out a project that we're calling the eDNA Basin-Wide Lamprey and Inventory Monitoring Project. And when you have a really big project, um, we have found that it's really good to make sure you have a good acronym for them. So in this case, the project that um, this project is is one that we're calling eBlimp. Um, all right, so we have a huge area of land that we want to sample, right? Um, so what are the methods for this? If we want to inform Pacific lamprey presence on the landscape, well, the first thing we need to do is think about where do Pacific lamprey live? Even if they're present in a, in a certain basin, they're not going to be in every stream under all stream conditions and all types of stream habitat. So to do that, um, some colleagues of mine examined current information on Pacific lamprey um, populations to understand what makes good lamprey habitat. And this is what they found. So it's about to get some, some real sciency here. Um, when we look at here, the probability that lamprey are present, we found two major variables that, that help determine whether or not they're present. One of them is temperature. So each of these lines is color coded to a different temperature. And then the other is stream slope. So how steep is that stream? When the water is very cold around 12 degrees Celsius, we really don't see any lamprey and it doesn't matter how steep or shallow that stream is. But as the water gets warmer, we see the probability of lamprey increase. Um, so the probability that lamprey are, are present increases. And then also, as it gets steeper, we see that lamprey don't really love super steep habitat. So where are lamprey going to be found? They're going to be found in areas that are a little bit warmer and a little bit less steep. And what that means is often some of our main stem rivers. They're not a headwater species like um, a lot of trout that we see, different cutthroat trout and rainbow trout. Um, they tend to like the bigger water systems. All right, so we, we've looked at that. What type of habitat characteristics do lamprey like? Now, the next question is, where do these desirable locations occur um, in a more specific context? Like, we want to see that on a map. So we're going to identify the stream and river segments with this ideal temperature and slope. So we take this information and we use some mapping tools and mapping software to project that out on the landscape. And that's what that looks like. This map here shows all of the stream segments in the historic range of Pacific lamprey that our model predicts has more than 0% chance that Pacific lamprey are present. So in some cases that might be, well, there's just a 1% chance, but it's not zero. Um, so that helps to narrow down, okay, Pacific lamprey are gonna be likely, most likely in these areas. Now, the next thing we're gonna do is start collecting eDNA samples in those areas. But oh boy, that is still a lot of stream to cover. Now, um, we use some more rules of thumb to help narrow this down and create a more structured sampling approach that was much more attainable, much more reasonable um, than just saying, we're gonna go out and look in every single one of these stream segments. So um, our methods, we focused again on subbasins or those fourth code HUCs, fourth code hydrologic units. And we focused that in Idaho, Oregon, and Washington for a couple reasons. One, um, this is the meat of the Columbia River Basin. Um, and it's also the three states that encompass the area where Pacific lamprey were petitioned for listing in that 2003 petition to the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So this highlights right now the area of greatest information needs. It also hosts some of the furthest inland populations of Pacific lamprey into Idaho. And so those are areas where they're most critically, likely most critically imperiled. And so information there is going to be put to use um, pretty immediately. 
All right, so that still doesn't really narrow it down that much because as you can see, we still have a lot of stream in there that we could sample. So let's narrow it down a little bit further. We're gonna look within these sub-basins, these hucks at the main stems. We're gonna sample every 15 kilometers as long as the probability of lamprey is more than zero. If we get to a place where the model says probability of lamprey is zero, then we'll stop sampling. And then we're also gonna sample the tributaries to those main stems if the probability of lamprey is greater than zero or if those areas are known to support Chinook salmon. Now, why are we adding Chinook salmon? Well, all models simply put are wrong. They all have room for error. And we know that our model isn't perfect. So we wanted to expand out a little bit and say, okay, let's give a little bit of wiggle room. What's a rule of thumb we can use that will help us expand beyond the model, but not so much that we're just swimming in samples that we'll never be able to analyze or trying to get to sites that just are unreasonable. So loosening that a little bit. And again, we chose Chinook salmon because lamprey tend to, at least historically, have had um, similar uh, similar overlap with a lot of salmon, um, especially in larger river systems. So this helped us narrow it down, but it is still a lot of work. And I want to recognize that um, this is an ongoing project. And over the last three years, we've had a lot of help from collaborators. We've had a lot of tribal partners. All of these tribes have a, a vested interest in Pacific lamprey. Um, we've had a lot of help from local watershed councils, including the Mid Coast. Um, you guys have been a really important partner in getting some coastal Oregon samples collected and um, very thoroughly, I might add. And then we also have um, the Bureau of Land Management in Oregon. Um, Tony Spitzak with the BLM has been a huge supporter of this work as well. And I, I know he's um, collaborated with the Mid Coast Watershed Council a lot as well. And so I wanted to recognize them. Um, a lot of funding for this came initially from the Forest Service and then with a lot of follow-up funding from Tony and the Bureau of Land Management. And then building upon our eBLIMP sampling, a lot of local groups have been able to leverage the existing funding that we got um, and use a cost match or find other ways to increase the sampling so we could expand out a little more and follow up on some positive lamprey detections and chase down a finer scale um, distribution of Pacific lamprey in various locations. All right, so now we're gonna get to the fun part, the results. What, where have we sampled so far in this area? This is what that map looks like. So again, these color-coded basins are that rank, um, that nature serve rank of what we, what we think, what we know about Pacific lamprey. So you can see we've been able to collect very thoroughly in Idaho, at least where they may still be present. Um, we've been able to collect a lot of samples in coastal Oregon. So that's big thanks to BLM and Mid Coast Watershed Council. And then we've been able also to collect samples in areas where um, we didn't have any information before. These basins that are shaded black because there's not enough information to even rank them. So that's a great first step in, in how all of this collaborative work is being um, going to be able to inform lamprey conservation and management. Okay, so that's nice. We collected all these samples, but where are the lamprey, right? We, we analyzed them and we looked for presence or absence of lamprey DNA, and this is what we found. So for the rest of the talk, the um, red triangles represent areas where we had positive detections of lamprey, specific lamprey DNA, and those gray dots, um, gray circles are areas where we did not detect their DNA. So um, I'm going to take a quick moment um, now as we kind of interpret these results uh, to look at Idaho, where we had some of the furthest inland detections of Pacific lamprey. All right, so we're going to zoom in, and I've added the stream layer um, from our lamprey model. So any stream segment you're seeing is where the model said there is greater than 0% probability of lamprey being present. Now in Idaho, um, we worked with state partners in the Nez Perce tribe and the Shoshone-Bannock tribe to collect samples very coarsely at first at those 15 kilometer intervals and then um, in tributaries um, that were um, likely to support lamprey. And then we were able to get additional funding with partners to follow up on, get some more coarse scale um, samples. And so in particular, um, we didn't see much lamprey occurrence in tributaries except in several locations. 
where we had a number of positive detections. Those areas are um, areas where the Nez Perce tribe has been working to reintroduce Pacific lamprey um, in streams where they had formerly been lost. And so this is great. eDNA is showing that we're detecting those fish that are part of those reintroduction efforts and the reintroduction is successful. So that's really cool. Another thing we did is we went back to the very furthest inland detection here in the Salmon River. We wanted to say, okay, we know they're in the Salmon River. How far do they go? And so we detected, um, Pacific, collected samples at a very tight spatial interval in here. This is one kilometer sampling interval. Every kilometer we collected an eDNA sample. And the furthest inland sample is near the town of Carmen, which is a very small town in um, Eastern Idaho. Um, for reference, I'm in Missoula, which is right up here or on the map, it's kind of hidden right here. But that is like, a, you know, thousands of river miles inland. And so that's super cool that we're seeing that. Um, but you know, today we don't really need to talk about Idaho. Let's talk about what's going on in your area in the mid coast. So this is a map of the model, again, where we're predicting the presence of Pacific lamprey. All of the areas in blue have a greater than 0% chance of lamprey being present. And all of the areas in gray or that are shaded out have um, what the model says is a 0% chance of lamprey being present. So we came in uh, with a little bit of funding from the eBlimp project, and we collected samples at these locations very coarsely. And then in collaboration with the Midcoast Council and with the BLM, we were able to follow up and get a lot more sampling done, which is super awesome. Um, so this is what we're looking at now. Let's see where those fish actually are on the landscape. Again, red is positive detections of lamprey DNA and the gray are places where we did not detect lamprey DNA. Um, so this is really cool. We're seeing tons of detections, especially here in the LC. Um, that's really great. Um, a lot more tributary detections. And another thing I wanna highlight is that um, all of these now green triangles represent positive detections where our model said, well, the probability of lamprey isn't zero, but it's less than 50. So flip of a coin, lamprey are probably not here, but we're not gonna say 0% chance. Well, our model is underperforming in these areas, which is something that was really cool to learn. Well, why, why is it underperforming here? It looks like it was performing fine, or even, you know, we had plenty of locations in Idaho where we didn't detect lamprey, even though we thought they would be present. Well, let's think about that for a little bit. Most of the available data prior to our eDNA sampling on the presence of lamprey was in Idaho. Now we know that Idaho has seen a big loss of lamprey. We also know that the habitat in Idaho is very different than the habitat in coastal Oregon. So the information that we put into our model doesn't really work as well for coastal Oregon. Now, another thing too that could be leading to this is that remember all these hydroelectric dams um, and actually how few there are here on the coast. Um, so there's not a lot of um, barriers to lamprey movement. And, and that is not really a surprise then that we have some of the less vulnerable populations on the coast. Now, where you have um, fewer barriers to lamprey movement, you're likely to have more fish present. And as you have more fish present, you're going to have more of that habitat occupied. Um, so that's what we think is kind of going on there. But with all of this sampling, um, we've been able to get more information and we can start to refine these models and say, okay, well, how do lamprey, um, what does lamprey habitat look like in these coastal basins? And how does that differ from inland areas? Um, and start to answer questions about like, well, what do lamprey prefer and why and under what circumstances? So to sum up um, some observations, since the summer of 2019, we have collected over 2000 samples, um, over 2000 of them have been analyzed for Pacific lamprey. Now about 850 of those were specifically um, funded through the eBlimp project, but then through this great collaboration with all of our partners, we've even had um, many more than that, that we've been able to collect with partners and analyze for Pacific lamprey as well. So leveraging that collaboration. Um, at those very, uh, in Idaho, we had limited occupancy in tributaries, except where the Nez Perce tribe has performed reintroduction efforts. 
that's really interesting to know. We identified a ton of vacant habitat that could be viable for reintroduction efforts moving forward. And as I just mentioned, our model underestimates lamprey occupancy in coastal habitat. So we need to do a better job of updating that model and refining our understanding. And you know, likely going back and sampling some more areas too, what we thought maybe wasn't viable lamprey habitat could very well have Pacific lamprey habitat in it. So that is the next step with the model in that, um, in that scope. All right, so what are we going to do with all this data now that we have it? Well, I think that it's really important for us to make this data available to any partners who are working on this issue and care about this issue. So um, we've been working to make the data publicly available on what we're calling the eDNA Atlas. Um, what is the eDNA Atlas? It's an interactive online map of eDNA locations and results. And so this is just a screenshot of what that looks like. Each black dot represents a place where an eDNA sample has been collected. Um, and if you Google search eDNA Atlas, you can go online yourself and take a look um, and you can click for different species and look at um, where these species have been found on the landscape. So this is a really cool tool. Um, it's available to, to everybody, folks like you and the public who might just be curious, hey, where is this species? But also uh, fisheries managers who are trying to understand all of the information on a particular species and get a sense of what directions to go with management. And finally, um, all of this information now is being used by tribes, state, and federal biologists to, to protect Pacific lamprey. And really the goal of all of this collaboration is to keep Pacific lamprey off the endangered species list. So one way to think about the endangered species list is it's sort of like the ICU. If you have a patient who is really, really sick, they're gonna go to the ICU and they're gonna get extra special care. But if we can do our part to actually keep somebody healthy enough that yeah, they need some special care, but they're not critically ill, right? It's the same with the Endangered Species Act. Let's do what we can now to protect Pacific lampreys so they don't fall that far down in, in our, um, in sort of a karma conservation perspective. And I think that this is demonstrating a really good, um, a, a, is a really good success story for collaboration and what can be done when we're working um, together. All right, so again, I just wanna acknowledge all of the folks that have helped collect these samples because it's definitely not possible without everyone on the ground who has local knowledge of the watersheds, of the sub-basins, has local knowledge of where the fish are um, and where they used to be, where they were historically. And then also folks and especially um, watershed councils and the Mid Coast Watershed Council have been really important in this respect. Folks that have relationships with private landowners in this area because streams flow through public lands and private lands in and out uh, over the course um, of their flow. And having those partnerships and having those relationships with private landowners is also really important to help communicate um, these efforts that we're all behind. Um, so with that, I'm going to take questions, but I just wanted to share with you a picture of an opportunity I had to help the Nez Perce tribe um, in a reintroduction effort. So we had adult Pacific lamprey that we were um, inserting tags so we could track the fish and I had the opportunity to go help them. Um, and if you ever see an adult lamprey, they have suction cup mouths and they want to um, latch onto things. That's how they kind of create their stability, but you have to be a little careful because they do have these very sharp teeth. Um, and so you don't really, you know, want them to hold on to you for too long. But great. So that is what I have for you today. And I would love to answer any questions you all have about eDNA or about Pacific lamprey or any of the work that we're doing today. Wow, uh, awesome. All right, let's all give Kelly a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. That was yeah. great. Um, so, Evan, do you want to, do you have a, a question you're looking at you want to maybe uh, start off with? Yeah, it's, I'll just go in order of how they came in. Um, so, Fran asked, um, can you get more than presence absence information from eDNA sampling? That's a great question. So, with eDNA, um, its strength is as a presence absence tool. However, um, we can also, uh, I mentioned PCR, we're using quantitative PCR. And quantitative means that we can actually measure how many DNA copies 
are in every liter of water that was sampled. Now that can be useful when you're trying to think about changes over time. More animals usually means more DNA. We can't um, currently extrapolate, um, you know, 100 copies means 100 fish. It's not that clear of a relationship. There are a lot of factors that can influence how much DNA you get in a sample, regardless of how many individuals are present. But it's really useful for looking at hot spots. So areas that have a lot of DNA, um, that might be that's a location where a manager might want to go um, look at the fish population and say, okay, well, do I have a lot of juveniles here? Is there active reproduction happening? And I can see that through the various life stages of fish. Um, so it's strengths as a presence action tool. You can get some information as to roughly or coarsely if you have areas with more fish or less fish. Um, but right now, that's sort of where we're at with eDNA, with this technology. Okay, uh, maybe I'll, I'll read the next one here. Um, who is that? Bill asks, is there lamprey eDNA data that shows a relationship to habitat that beaver create? <laughs> um, that's a really good question. And you know, I hadn't thought about it. Um, and I also haven't seen any research looking at that, but I'm actually going to write that down because I think there are a lot of things about beaver habitat, especially fine sediments that would create really good habitat for um, the juveniles that like to burrow in that sediment. Um, so short answer to date, I don't, I'm not familiar with any research that's looked at that and I'm not sure that anybody has. So new research ideas. And just as a quick connection kind of with that question, uh, what's your, your guess as to whether or not beaver dams pose any kind of migration barrier to lamprey? Uh, hmm. You know, fish have incredible ability to swim through log jams. Um, they've dealt with that, you know, over, over many thousands of years, fish have dealt with it. Um, there are times of year where, you know, there's flooding that creates fish passage that maybe isn't there during low flows, but also fish are like, you know, they're slimy and squirmy. They can get through things. So um, in my experience, that's not the case, but you know, there could be instances where it is for the most part, I don't think it's going to be a huge deal. Yeah, that was, that was a bit of a leading question because I, I think it's, it's pretty clear that they can get past beaver dams and they're, they're a lot different than big hydrologic concrete dams yeah. put in. Yeah. So, anyway. so I, I'll have another follow-up there. I, I know, Kelly, we had talked previously about actually a, an assay for beaver themselves. Um, yeah. and, and that's kind of close, or you mentioned mm -hmm. kind of being close to that. Could you just comment on that real quick? Yeah, that's, um, that's another very good point. So um, our lab looks at many species and not just fish. So if it's something that could be in water, you can collect an eDNA sample and see if it's there. And so for an animal like beaver that spend most of their time in water, even though they're not a fish, their DNA is still going to be in there. So our lab has been working on an eDNA assay to detect beaver and um, Trevor and Evan have helped us with some samples that we can use as positive controls to test how it's working um, in areas where beaver are present. So um, yeah, I'm actually noted that I have on Monday in my calendar, I was like, I get in on these beaver samples. So nice. um, I'll make a note about that too to get back to <laughs> Nice. All right, so kind of another application question from Jerry. Um, do you have any correlation of presence absence of lamprey with history of aerial spraying of herbicides, which is a big topic um, out here in Lincoln County? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And I don't know that anybody has looked at that, but I would suspect I would suspect that if there is evidence of, a, of, it, of aerial herbicides affecting other fish species, um, it probably affects lamprey too. Fish are generally sensitive to that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But there has not, to my knowledge, been specific research looking at the effects of aerial herbicides on Pacific lamprey. Great. Well, and uh, moving through here, this is a comment that's worth reading. Great presentation. Well done and interesting. So, hey. uh, <laughs> that's what I want to hear. Yeah. Um, here's one. Below it though, how do you explain the far upstream presence in Idaho, given all the hydropower dams with fish-centric ladders? 
you know, it's a mystery to us too. Uh, we were sure that they were not going to be there and they were, um, and I don't, I don't know. Um, Pacific lamprey are, it's mysterious. Um, I, you know, it, it just makes me think about all of the things that we don't know about Pacific lamprey because they're not a species that um, is driving our economy. So how much we know and, and have mitigated for trout and salmon because we like to eat them. Um, yeah, it's interesting. And so I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I can't really explain it. There is some evidence very, very limited evidence that some Pacific lamprey may not be migratory, may not be going out to the ocean. That is one possibility um, here is that some of those fish in those very inland locations could be operating under what we call a resident life history. They're not migratory, but we don't know because we just know so little about this, about this fish. So uh, Jacob asks, uh, what have the counts been like, I assume lamprey counts, um, going through the observation window at Bonneville, if you know anything Oh, about Bonneville, that. let's see. I think in my talk I had a, I have Lower Granite Dam, not Bonneville, I'm not sure about Bonneville, but um, Lower Granite Dam has been in the tens between, between 15 and 60 since 2005, wow. so not a lot. Wow. I had kind of a, a connected question. The, the reintroduction efforts that are, were pretty far inland and past these dams and you were, you were saying were successful, I'm just kind of wondering what the reintroduction process is for lamprey. Are they, um, do they follow their natal stream like salmon do so they'll they will kind of avoid a stream and go back to where they spawned it, or, or are they better dispersers or you got to bring them into a new basin for them to- Yeah, this is back. a super cool question. So they are not like salmon and trout in that respect. They don't home to natal spawning grounds, which is also like, why would you go all the way that far into Idaho when there may be habitat closer, right? So it's like there's another another mystery, like why, why is this happening? Um, so yeah, it, and we don't know because we haven't studied this species enough, right? And this is also where I think there's a lot of room for learning from tribes that have looked um, and lived with these animals on the landscape for hundreds and hundreds of years, right? And they have knowledge of places and what was there where we can integrate into our long-term conservation planning. But um, yeah, that's another question too that from a genetic standpoint, I'm really interested in because when you look at the diversity of um, salmon in a particular area, they're more likely to be more closely related to each other than they are to fish in the next stream or next basin over, right? Because of that natal homing. Pacific lamprey don't do that. So you're gonna have tons of genetic diversity all over the place. Um, and so, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question, but they don't, they don't home to natal spawning grounds. Well, so do you know, are they um, like breeding them in, in captivity and then putting oh, them in yeah, the sorry. and then seeing them come back from that? And that's that's how you know the reintroduction works. So what the what is um, what the tribes have been doing, and the Yakma Nation too, and the Umatilla have all been working to to perform um, reintroduction efforts in various locations. But um, you have the adults uh, that, and and like that picture I showed, we were sorting the adult lamprey. Um, and then holding them in a, in a hatchery tank type system until they approach um, spawning time. So they come, lamprey come back from the ocean, but they hold um, for quite a while in the freshwater areas. Sometimes that's a couple months, but there are some subset of lamprey that come back and stay in freshwater for almost a year. So that's another interesting thing is we're not really sure why, but the fish that tend to come back and stay longer tend to be bigger and tend to go further inland. So that's kind of a clue. Like if those fish are bigger, they may be going further inland because they're like, well, I can make it further inland and maybe there's more vacant habitat inland, you know? So lots of questions there. But um, anyway, take these fish, hold them in a fish facility until it approaches spawning time. And then the adults are released into um, vacant streams or habitat that's being reintroduced. Um, and then and then spawning at that location. And so this is where eDNA is useful. Um, Pacific lamprey do die after they spawn. So they spawn once and then they die. 
Um, and so if we're getting detections in those areas, you know, a year later, that means that this, it's the reintroduction was successful and, and they did <laughs> picking up DNA of those juveniles. So the next part of the question then is those juveniles go back out to the ocean. Where are they going when they come back, right? Like some of these reintroduction efforts in Idaho could actually be really beneficial to all of this vacant lamp lamprey habitat, you know, across the board because they're not necessarily going all the way back to Idaho when they come back as adults. Great. Well, thanks for letting me steal some of the uh, yeah the time here. Uh, Evan, you want to chew up another one here? Sure. Uh, Adriana asks um, the samples in Idaho on the coast. When were they taken? Like what months of the year? And she also oh, says, yeah. "Thank you for your wonderful presentation." Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so we have been sampling during low flows. Um, so basically after spring floods come down um, and then before, especially in coastal systems, before we start getting any fall rains that would cause flows to come back up. Couple of reasons for that. If you have higher, if you have flooding, um, you could dilute the DNA, especially if there's not many animals present. Um, it's also really difficult to get into some of these areas when there's flooding. Um, and then sometimes when there's a lot of flooding, there's um, suspended sediment that can clog the filter and, and make the sample a little more difficult to deal with. Great. Um, let's see, where were we? On Fred's now. So he says, uh, besides ESA and tribal interests, can you elaborate on the importance of lamprey? Yeah. So um, yeah, aside from these sort of um, like this cultural significance to Pacific, uh, Pacific lamprey tribes and then like the legal aspect of the ESA, um, the importance of lamprey, well, as an anadromous species or a species that goes out to the ocean and comes back, we know um, along with anadromous salmon, Pacific salmon, that when those adults go out to the ocean, they're eating lots of things out there and accumulating a lot of nutrients. When they come back and they spawn, and then when they die, those nutrients as they decay are being um, supplied to our freshwater system. So there's a really important exchange of nutrients through that process of the animals coming back and then their bodies decaying. Um, you know, there's other sort of just broad societal values. Um, we as a society have started to value diverse um, biological diversity more. And so preserving species, even if there's not necessarily a recreational or economic value behind them um, is something that there's more interest behind now. And so we have more, more partners, more user groups that are interested in um, just helping species persist for their intrinsic value. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, Sarah asked uh, lifespan. So I think you kind of mm -hmm. talked about their kind of juvenile time frame, but then kind of what's their, like how long are they out in the ocean and then back as adults? How, how yeah, long can that be? Yeah, it's um, about 10 to 12 years is what we estimate. Um, so those few, uh, seven or so-ish years in the sediment and then a couple years in the ocean. Um, yeah, so about 10 to 12 years, depending on how much time they take. Mm -hmm. And there was a couple of questions actually that came in privately that were asking if they attach to salmon to move upstream, mm -hmm. but. Um, you know, yeah. I don't think that they do coming back because once Pacific lamprey enter freshwater, they actually, when they come back as adults, they stop feeding. Um, I, I'm not sure why, and that's not, I mean, I think for the most part, some salmon do that too. It's like a physiological change in their body where it's like, okay, I don't need more energy. Like I'm, I'm making my eggs and making my sperm already. I don't need a ton more energy. Um, so I don't think they hitch rides on the way back. I'm not, I can't say for sure, um, but my guess would be probably more on the way out. Mm -hmm. Well, um... Ari said, awesome presentation. I may have missed it earlier, but was any of the data shown on the maps collected beyond 2019? Yes, okay, yeah, so that was a question. When were samples collected? Um, so sampling started in, we have some like historic samples that were collected like in 20, historic, they were like, you know, 2014, 15, 16. Um, but a lot of this work started in earnest 2018, 2019, and then there were some 2020 samples this year. And I know Trevor helped collect some, um, and then Tony Spitzak with the BLM also collected quite a few. Um, so there was, this data is all like newest recent data. I made those maps earlier this week. So 
Mm-hmm. Cutting uh, your day is off of Gary. <laughs> So I think just one more, and then Trevor, I think you had one pre-question we can get to last. Um, uh, sorry, I lost it now. I'll find some other ones. I could, uh, you know, keep this keep this going a long time if we want. <laughs> Fascinating. Uh, got all evening. <laughs> just had a couple couple more. Thanks for sharing incredible research. Um, actually, yeah, the the other ones were all just kind of related to if they attach to fish when you're climbing up a ladder. So that's that's oh, kind of yeah. what you answered. Yeah, yeah, you know, I don't I don't think they do as much. They still use like when they swim in the ladders that they swim up, they still like they will suction onto a wall and then kind of like propel themselves and jump up and then latch on again. So it's sort of like this kind of funny jumping pattern. I'm pretty <laughs> sure. There are videos of it online. So if you did a Google search for like lamprey passage or lamprey swimming, I'm seeing some thumbs up there. Yeah, it is pretty cool to look at. Um, but the big thing is that a lot of fish ladders are built for salmon that will jump, you know, several feet up and also forward um, into a pool, like a step pool. But lamprey can't do that both up and forward, particularly if they don't have something to latch on to in order to kind of propel or jump off. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, the question that I, I got was about, um, and I think you did answer it to an extent already, but it, it asked about, um, can eDNA sampling be adapted to detect upstream infestations of noxious weeds or invasive organisms? For example, Japanese knotweed, which could spread down downstream via vegetative propagation. Yeah, yep. So a really good application of eDNA, as, as you've guessed, is for also monitoring for invasive species. And again, because it's so highly sensitive, right? We could probably detect invasive species before we actually are able to capture them um, if they're present at low abundance. Our lab focuses on um, uh, mostly on animals so uh, it, that are invasive. And so it's a lot of fish species, zebra mussels, that kind of thing, but it certainly can and has been applied to plants as well. Okay, and also yeah. other um, like, uh, like viruses that would then be in the water. So like a lot of amphibian or fish viruses, that's another application of eDNA too. Well, um, one more little <laughs> thing that I think is, is good to ask about because you know, one of my first questions about the eDNA was how broad of a, a of like a sample size can you get? How many species can you detect from a single, you know, filtration process? We've only been talking about basically one at a time here. Yeah. Um, could you speak to the, the potential for multiple species detection? Yeah, for sure. So if that species is in the stream, we're going to get its DNA. So a DNA sample contains um, DNA from thousands of organisms that are there, right? Like everything from the invertebrates to the plants to um, the fish and other animals that have been in the system. Now, how many detections can we get off a sample? That's limited by a number of different things. Um, One, how much volume of DNA we can get off of and so that's sort of like a laboratory limitation. So when we have our sample and we have all the DNA that's cleaned up in the lab, we can usually analyze it about 10 or so times. Sometimes, you know, if something doesn't turn out quite as nice as we want it, we'll reanalyze it for the same species. But um, if you want to get more species, do more individual species analyses, you might, you know, collect another sample. So say you were interested in like 30 species, you might want to collect a couple samples at that location. Uh, One thing that our lab is working on is a process called multiplexing. And what that allows you to do is run one reaction, but have multiple assays going at the same time. So in one reaction, you can say, okay, well, not just our Pacific lamprey here, but our um, bull trout here and our northern, you know, invasive northern pike or invasive smallmouth bass here. And um, do we have Chinook salmon in this sample as well? And so, um, yeah, it, and, and the D, yeah, so there's DNA from, from everything in there. There is something to be said, though, for how far away, right? As you can see on those maps, we didn't necessarily have like one sample at the bottom of a basin that represented everything in that entire basin because the DNA does degrade over time and over space. 
And it also settles down to the stream bottom. It doesn't stay suspended the entire time. So a single sample has a certain spatial scope that it can tell you about. The closer you are to an organism, the more likely you are to pick up its DNA. Um, depending on the size of the system, you might be able to detect that individual or that species reliably. Um, if it's there at like a population level abundance, you know, 100 meters, a kilometer downstream, you'll likely be able to detect it. If there's only one individual, you need to collect more samples to guarantee that you'll pick up that species. We'll do, unless you have more, Trevor, I think Fran's got the last one here. Um, how long does DNA persist? And are these samples stored to analyze in the future for unanticipated questions? Yes, great. Um, so DNA persisting in the environment, it varies, but usually DNA from an individual will persist for about 24 hours. Um, that's what some studies have shown where they put it like a put a like a salamander in a little cage in the stream and how long does the DNA persist in the stream once we take that salamander out? It's usually about 24 hours. There are certain things that can speed that up or slow that down. Warmer temperatures, more acidic water will cause the DNA to degrade faster. Uh, more UV light also, that is something that causes degradation of DNA. Now, as far as the sample in the lab, we do keep all, we archive all of our samples, have them all in deep freezers so um, that we can analyze them again for questions that we don't even know we have right now, right? And that is another really beautiful thing about this tool is that, you know, we might not have been looking for a particular species when we went to collect that sample, but it's a timestamp of everything that was there. And so that's another really cool thing. And we've been able to repurpose a lot of samples for other studies as well. So great efficiency with this tool too. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wanna thank all of you for your attention tonight and for um, coming to hear this talk. It was really a pleasure. And um, if you have more questions, feel free to email me. I know Evan and, and Trevor have, um, have questions, or have my email address and you could contact me. I'm happy to chat lamprey or other fish questions anytime. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. And I'll, I'll just say with, with our working with you, it's you've always like anytime we email, it's amazing how quick you get a response to <laughs> us. And um, the, you know, tutorials you've taught now, Ari, Trevor, and myself all how to do uh, this. And, and it's been awesome working with you as a partner. And this is really cool thank to you. share this with the rest of our group out here. So thank you, Kelly. And um, yeah, we'll let you go. Yeah, <laughs> Maybe I'll see you guys in person next time. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> thanks, Bye. Kelly. Well,